honor of and to celebrate uh, Women's History Month, which is, happens in March, uh, we've decided to kind of branch outside of the walls of SHIFT and talk to a women-owned business that we have had the opportunity to get to know and even work with um, on projects here in the last year. And that is uh, welcome to, to the show. <laughs> Red Tree Web Design, and with us is founder and CEO Misha Gerhardt. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having <laughs> me. I'm really excited to be chatting today. Yeah, thanks so much for being with us. So, so we met initially through the Chatham's uh, Center for Women's Entrepreneurship, I think I said that right, um, <laughs> and a, a little program that they did there, um, the Roadmap Program. Um, and so we got to know each other a little bit through that, which is, which was just really great. And you brought such good energy to that group. Um, it's fun to, to get to know you there, but then we've also, as I mentioned, kind of collaborated, collaborated a little bit on client work and, and projects that, um, that you worked with Cynthia. Yeah. Yeah. It was one of our favorite projects. Honestly, we just did a project so kind of, we do at least once a quarter, we kind of look at all of our projects and we say like, what could be done better? You know, the whole start, stop, pause kind of. Mm -hmm. idea and what processes do we need to improve on and like uh the two that we have worked on they were like yes like dream like we want more um and it just it's just so refreshing as you guys kind of know to have like a lot of things like just given and then like we don't have to constantly like ask and ask and ask mm -hmm. and ask so it was it was a lot of fun it was yeah, great well, work that. Guys did too. yeah it was really yeah. it was great to work with you too it's nice to have a you know, collaborators who um, we can rely on and who come yeah. in with their own bright ideas. And so it, um, definitely looking forward to more work together in the future. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Absolutely. So I think we can kind of dig in. We have a few questions, um, but you know, we'll see where this conversation goes. Cool. Go any direction. And you definitely want to um, have you ask us questions too. We'll see how our experiences are similar and different. But so, Misha, how did you get started with your uh, with Red Tree with your with your business? Okay, so, um, you know, I wish that I could just like tell you like I just woke up one day and it was like my dream to make beautiful websites. But in reality, um, I was I went to college at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, and someone offered me a case of beer to build out a website, and I was like, "Cool, man! Like <laughs> I like this exchange." Um, and I, I had a couple more this. people, right? <laughs> I had a couple more people who were like, hey, I need, you know, at the Art Institute, in order for you to graduate, you have to have had, to have had a website, right? So mm -hmm. I actually really like doing websites. I also really kind of like beer. So it was like a win-win situation. They needed something. And then nine times out of 10, we even kind of have somewhat of a collateral as well. So they're photographers and something like that. But I really enjoyed it. It really, really did. Like, it, that's kind of my joke is that I fell into this because someone offered me a case of beer, but I really did like taking someone, a photographer that I knew in their work and then putting it together in a, in a display, in an animated display too. Cause like we used to build things back in flash, right? Which was super fun. And then you used to like have to code buttons inside of flash. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, right, <laughs> right, exactly. So like, it, it was just a lot of fun. And then from there, I've just kind of been in part of smaller companies um, the last one that I was in, it got to a point in time that my, my boss at the time was she's old enough to retire. She wanted to chase grandbabies versus chasing invoices. And she approached me and said, do you want to buy this? And I said, sure. Like I've, I've been here for the last eight years. Like these clients are my clients. Um, and I figured honestly, worst that can happen was it wouldn't work out owning my own business. And I could just go find a job. And five years later, here we are. Um, I have a staff of six, nope, P pandemic. Uh, I have a staff of four mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I really, really love it. it. It is it is now that I get to wake up every morning and build websites, right? And I get to actually work with businesses and see impact in businesses and it's super awesome. And they so. still pay you in beer. <laughs> they don't pay me in beer anymore listen beer doesn't agree with me anymore honestly yeah. we'll do right. we'll do coffee and we'll do ice cream all day long mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but but no not anymore yeah you've you've, you've uh, moved on from that yes. 
well, I'm so a mother of, now, right? Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, so speaking of challenges, um, mm. like, you know, not being able to have beer and, but getting all the joys of, um, of a new world, what in business, like, have there been particular things that were hurdles or, I mean, obviously the pandemic has been a challenge, you know, for all of us, but even before that, getting to that fifth year is like a, is a big deal, right? Like, I wanted to like take a year long vacation and I was like, oh no, that defeats the purpose. But like, yes, like at five years, I was like, right? Cause there's statistics actually. So I did this two years into, cause most businesses fail after, you know, before two years, two years, I kind of let out like a, and then five years I was like, oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Right. But like big hurdles, I, so I, I consider myself to be a learner. And I love learning. I love listening. I love learning. I love new challenges. My old boss used to say, you're like a dog with a bone. Like you just you have to kind of keep learning. And I think that that skill set has really helped me a lot in owning a business because anytime that you're like, I got this, I know how to run a business. I know how to do this. A pandemic happens or a child happens or something along the lines. And I think you really do have to have this like dedication and this sort of drive to really keep wanting to learn more to grow um and I know one of one of my actual big challenges um are you guys familiar with the term imposter syndrome mm -hmm. okay all right mm -hmm. so I'm getting some head shakes I like mm -hmm. it I like it so I feel like I feel like you both right, do challenge with this yourself mm -hmm. yeah so I'm sure should I should I set some context of so yeah imposter syndrome it, it it's kind of the way that it sounds right so imposter syndrome is like you didn't actually earn anything that you've gotten so if you are uh, successful or if you've um, achieved high rankings or whatever that may actually be it was by luck or it was by someone else sort of doing for you or your community or something else has, has actually not this is imposter syndrome has absolutely nothing to do with you know yourself right so mm -hmm. I get stuck in that so 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 much of ah someone else just gave me an intro oh you know I was I was a part of Chatham and you know that's how I I, I met Shift and you know all this other stuff so like I don't think of it as being a no I you know I reached out I said hello and and things like that I don't look at it that way mm -hmm. so how do you guys let me What's ask your you relationship? a little bit. Where do you think that comes from, though? What for yourself, for when you have this imposter feeling, is that like inherent to you? Is it the world around you that's influencing you? What do you think? I was just gonna say, I feel like we need ice cream for this one um, <laughs> uh, and coffee, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I, I love to say that it's you know, and and there's a lot of things sort of that I, I would unpack and as, you know, having a daughter myself, like I think that maybe if I were to look at sort of my childhood, yeah, like maybe there's a lot of things where like, girls are pretty, they're not smart and like, you know, be blunt, but don't be aggressive. And my, my mother was a very, was, is a, a very blunt woman herself. So I got a lot of that. And then, you know, at the same time as I got older and stuff, you need to kind of calm that down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, I'll take the responsibility and sort of remove society out of this one and say that like, I have a whole challenge of my self-worth and, and really tipping my hat to my drive and my dedication and, and seeing that that's where my success has sort of come from. Yes, I'm a very spiritual person. So like, yes, um, I, I've been blessed and, but, but I honor those blessings with hard work. Right. So like, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily say luck, but I do say the blessings and, but I do see a lot of this, right. Women, women in business versus just, and we were talking a little bit about this before. So it's a women owned business versus just, I don't, they don't, really, do they even say men own businesses? That's not no, it's just a sure. business. Yeah. It's, it's a just small a business. business. It's a medium sized business. It's a corporation. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say, I think, you know, imposter, you know, you can have moments when you're reflecting about why you're feeling this imposter syndrome syndrome, and it could be something that is kind of 
coming from within or, you know, kind of pointing to the path that led you to where you are today and how many people were a part of that journey and giving all of the credit to them. I think it's hard for people, most people to, you know, kind of say, I'm successful because I have that drive. I have the desire and motivation to learn. I, you know, the thing, whatever those characteristics are, it's hard to, to say those that you feel like, oh, I'm kind of just propping myself up. But, you know, it's, it's part of the DNA of who you are as a leader of your company. And it's important. And, um, but I think, you know, so, so Cynthia and I both come from, we have worked in a family owned business. And I think, and I won't speak to, to this for you, Cindy, because it might not be uh, the thing, but for me, for a long time, I was put in a director position at my family owned business. And I often thought, well, people think I have this job because my aunt's the owner of this company. Mm. And so I often felt like I had to over approve myself and really just like, go crazy with it because I mean, it was a three, 400 person company and I'm running, you know, million dollar monthly budgets on, you know, paid advertising, like what qualifies her? She was just working at a nonprofit in the city of Pittsburgh a couple months ago. What the heck? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I kind of dealt with it in that phase of my life. I feel like somewhat I may have outgrown it, but I, I do, I, I did deal with it a lot then for sure. And, and when you say, so now you're going to bust out the ice cream, right? So like when you say that you've outgrown this, like, do, do you just literally attribute this to like life experiences now that you can kind of, or, or did you have to like, really like work on that? Yeah, good question. I definitely had to really work on it, but I think that me reflecting on, you know, how I got to where I am today, I can now dial into that experience. So when something comes up in our business, whether it be an HR or a, an accounting or, you know, whatever a client issue, whatever issue comes up, I can lean into that experience. I've dealt with something similar, maybe not the exact same thing, but I feel confident enough that, you know, that Cynthia and I can, can work together to conquer whatever the issue is. So it's nice to have a partner in that for sure. But, um, but I feel like it's kind of just through self, you know, awareness and just feeling confident that I've had some experience with a multitude of issues. Yeah. Yeah. What about my, you, Cynthia? Yeah. I, there, uh, I've had different kinds of experiences with that imposter feeling and it's not sort of across the board it's only in certain areas um but, uh, so it, and it, and it can come in surprising places i think that you know kind of like what you're saying sarah i feel like i'm better at coping with it but like i do things like like i wear my school ring as my tiny little suit of armor to remind myself you know of things that i've achieved in the past and it's just a little reminder that i have for me that's really not as much for anybody else, you know what I mean? So there's things like mm -hmm. that. But then that, that, that suit of armor also has some holes in it, chinks in it, if you will, because I remember, remember when I was applying to college, I had to do an alumni interview, do you know what I mean? Like they had to interview with someone local. And I spoke with someone, I drove down here to Pittsburgh from Butler with my mom. And my mom is, uh, a little side story she um she wanted it to seem as though i had done this on my own you know and so we we drove by the person's house we figured out where it was and then i went and dropped her off at like an eaton park or something for an hour and then i drove back by myself you know for the <laughs> thanks mom right? thanks for helping me up <laughs> but right. um but I, so we had a good little interview and at the end of the interview i asked the guy you know what do you think do you think i'm gonna be accepted and he says well you're a woman and we have a lot of quotas for that right now. So I think you'll probably, your scores are good. You'll probably get it. And so that was both kind of like, oh, great. I was kind of like, oh, really? Like that, mm -hmm. like it was a, it was a very, um, it really put it, put this taint, like this, this pall on the whole thing. Like, am, do I deserve this, you know? Mm -hmm. So in the, in the end, I, I have come to think that, you know, those, the, the, there really was at the time a quota, you know, get more, more women into the school. Um, but, but I think that the women in the school, we, you know, we held our own, we, you know, we came to, you know, we, we did the work, you know, we were 
just as smart as anybody else, but, um, mm -hmm. but it was a thing. And so little things like that, I guess you might call them microaggressions or whatever, you know, they, I think that they, they are part of, it's not just all yourself and your own insecurities, but the, it's the world around you either putting in little, little pins and needles or reinforcing, you know, your own personal fears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like all of us have, you know, this whole like, so society, right, has got like a quota or it's got, uh, you know, a specific bias. And, um, you know, I, my, very similar story, right, to, to what you were talking about, Sarah, is like, I, I was like, I, I'm only as successful because I got to buy this business. Like I didn't start it from, right? So like, mm -hmm. I bought a client list and but meanwhile too, right? So you guys both did it, which I thought was beautiful. It's like, this is where I was, right? But then I'm, you know, I'm tipping my hat to the experience that I was bringing and now can bring into my business. And, you know, yes, my mom had to drive, but like, I, I did it, right? I filled a quota and then guess what? I got in there and I crushed it, right? Like, yeah. so, so it's, I don't know. And like, I get challenged with this too, is like, do I, for the longest time, I don't know if you guys are WeBank certified or not, um have you guys we are this? okay oh, so oh, oh i didn't know what you're saying <laughs> so, yeah. well for the longest time i was like you know i don't want to just be certified or someone to give me business just because i got a v right i'm like no i don't want that mm -hmm. but in the reality of things is like if someone if someone has to meet a quota and it could potentially increase my business um yeah okay i'll take that and then once i get in there i'll crush it right. so that one took me a really long time to do. And I, I still kind of grapple with this. Do I want to be a statistic or a quota that someone hits? Right. Kind of. Yeah, I think because like I, mama loves I think money, we did, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we struggle with the exact same thing. I think, you know, when you, a lot of um, city and government work in, in our creative world, you know, you get it, you get your foot in the door because you have this certification and they have a certain you know, diversity quota that you're trying to, to make. But I love what you're saying about whatever gets the foot in the door, gets the foot in the door. And then it is all up to you, baby. Like you have to prove it. You have to do the hard, your team has to be delivering, you know, an awesome, you know, experience. Right. And then that leads to more work. And we have, you know, we had a period, I would say a run of four years where we just had city contract after city contract after city contract. And it started with one that mm -hmm. then, you know, because we were a certified women owned business, we got in that door. So, you know, we do struggle with it though, you know, you know, what does that all mean? And how, how, how does it set us apart in a good way or a bad way? I think it's important though, for us to remember that those, those sort of advantages or little legs up are there because there are so many other things that are stacked against women in business and in society, mm -hmm. just generally. Um, and so we can say, oh, wow, I'm being given a little boost. Well, I'm being given a little boost to catch up to the people that are up here because of yeah. other advantages that I am, that I'm never going to have, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and so I, we should definitely take advantage of all of those. Things. I was just yeah. going to say like, amen, sister. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Right. Like, you know, and grass is always greener on the other side. And that's why I, you know, I do challenge with it is like, if, if for some reason someone wants to give me an advantage, I do want to take care of it. But like, yeah, there's a huge conversation um, that, you know, other smart people sort of have not say that we're not all smart, but like, why is there sort of that imbalance right now? Mm -hmm. What I'm super excited about is like, so um, someone, someone just did an article about like, what the economy is doing now, now that like COVID is over, I mean, COVID isn't really over, but like, as we're coming down from COVID, like, what is the economy really looking like? And the, the part that I thought was really interesting is, so women make up about, uh, what, 25% of the workforce, and majority of the people who left the workforce because of COVID were women, Women. Mm -hmm. So, right. So, so now they're, they're, you know, even smaller part of the workforce, but then majority of the people who left actually left. Um, but I'm curious to see, I think a lot of them are going to start their own businesses. Mm -hmm. And I, I've known a few who were like, I'm very happy at this job, um, kind of, right. But like, it doesn't give me the flexibility. They're really like, 
being on me about like my kid crawling up my back and stuff. And <laughs> what am I supposed to do? I can't put him on the street because CYF is going to call me. Like, so, so I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to work with other, you know, mompreneurs or whatever, and we're going to crush it. Or I'm going to work with other women who kind of understand these things. So like, I'm very curious to see how many of those women that left the workforce are going to come in with their own businesses and their own mm -hmm. contracts and things like that. It's going to be awesome. I'm super excited yeah. to see what happens. Yeah. I think the other thing that I hope could be a, a, you know, a benefit out of this too, is that as women are reentering the workforce, that their employers have a different level of understanding of now they know, I mean, HR departments are having to kind of, you know, for larger companies are having to look at these accommodations that they have for working parents and, you know, be a little bit more um, thoughtful and meaningful about, you know, just not be so cut and dry with their policies. I hope that some of that softens up a little bit to, to be more flexible and responsive to their workforce and the fact that, um, you know, parents have different needs. Right. I agree. So. And I think that there's a line though, I think so, because my wife and I talk about this a lot as a, as a business owner, right? Like as a, as a corporation, right? Maybe they could go from making a billion dollars to making $10 million if they were to alleviate a little bit, but like, they're still a business at the same time. So like my wife and I struggle with this a lot where, you know, we had our daughter at home and her company was really understanding, but like, she knew that there was going to be a point in time where they're like, listen, this isn't acceptable anymore. Or like, you know, yes, we were okay here because of those things, but like, we're not going to be as lenient later because it's a business at the end mm -hmm. of the day. So like there is the two sides of some things. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but the I, bottom I, line. I, I, yeah, I hope as well that people will see that the bottom line can be even better if they give a little bit more flexibility. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it reduces yeah. turnover, if it increases, you know, employee satisfaction, if it just makes it a better environment, all of those things, they're maybe yeah. not as immediately measurable, but they have to have long-term effects and impacts. Yeah, well, speaking of that, how has um, Red Tree sort of weathered the storm in terms of changes due to the pandemic? And, you know, do you see anything that you're currently doing kind of sticking even after the pandemic um, is over. I think, you know, Cynthia and I grapple a lot with what does our office look like mm. in the future? Like how much we work, we're working well virtually. How much do we want to, you know, rock the boat back towards the other direction? Um, so we haven't figured it out yet, but what are, what are you, some of, you know, what are you doing at Red Tree? We want to steal all your good ideas, basically. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I think uh, it's what everyone else is, is doing. So, um, my developer is actually out in Rhode Island. And so we were already fairly familiar with like remote working and remote correspondence. So when the pandemic hit, it was like, cool, just everyone grab your laptops, grab your chair and like just hunker down. Right. So like, and we were in a co-working space. So I agree with you. So we are not probably going to go back to in office anytime soon. I do think that there are certain businesses that prefer a face-to-face um, and, and they do prefer like to point at things sometimes and I get that. So we still have a co-working space, but as far as me personally, as far as my staff, like we were talking about with flexibility, like mind blown as to what an hour a day is now back in your control of commuting. My one, uh, my project manager lives, oh, I don't. She, I think she lived in Lawrenceville at the time. We were in Southside at the time. That was a 45, if not hour long commute. So one way, right? Because mm -hmm. of all the traffic and everything. So like she gets 10 hours back in a week and, mm -hmm. and we're just as effective. She can go out to New York, visit her family and work. Um, so we'll, we are going to be staying 100% remote and it gives me an exponential amount of, of talent that I can go out and find anywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. It gives me and my family flexibility to go out and do anything and everything that mm -hmm. we want. Mm -hmm. And so, your team. But, and, and, and my team. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably our, our biggest. But other than that, we were kind of set up for a lot of the shifts, the most the pivots that a lot of people working from home, being effective of working from home things along those lines. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. What is Red Trees, like what do you consider your, you know, 
your special sauce? What's what's so awesome yeah. about you? Well, as, as a sort of side, also, you know, you kind of took over another business. So how did you get to that special sauce when you already had this other thing kind of there to, you know, integrate with, if you will? Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the business that I bought, um, she did everything. She called it e-marketing, right? So she would do everything e-marketing, which was a lot of SEO, it was a lot of like uh, PPC, uh, inbound, I think is the correct term. I always get confused of inbound, outbound, but that's neither here nor there. That's that's your guys' face. And yep. <laughs> very happy that that is your guys' face. Um, so when, when I bought it, I followed that same mentality, but I also got like super excited, right? Cause I was like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna start doing photography and videography and I'm gonna do like, I'm gonna do all this stuff and it's gonna be awesome and then needless to say it wasn't awesome I was producing crap work and and I was getting into things that you know I enjoyed to do maybe via like my phone with my wife or with my kin but like to do it in a professional sense wasn't as gratifying it didn't like it so I took a huge step back and to answer sort of Cynthia's question is so Red Tree we specialize in websites and that is where we stay and that is our sauce now with any business, right, with a website, there's a lot of things that go into websites, right? When it comes to social media, email, PPC, all that stuff that drives traffic in, hard no, don't know, don't have any interest in any of it. Um, we do do a, a significant amount of SEO, but I still kind of put that in the realm of someone is looking for. Um, but my secret sauce, what I like to, to tell clients, what I like to focus on is brand and users. And your audience probably knows this, but let's set some context of brand, right? So brand is not your logo. Let's just throw that one out the window. Mm -hmm. A brand is a feeling. It's, it's what people feel when they engage with your business. So between your employees to the person scanning you into your building, all the way up to someone who is going to be signing a multi-million dollar contract with you, right? These are all feelings. This is your brand. This is what people feel whenever it comes to your business. And then there's the users. These are the people that I just kind of talked about. What I see a lot of people not doing well is utilizing a website that conveys their brand and also speaks to their user. Because nine times out of 10, people are either, they focus on their brand. Hey, look at what I can do. Hey, look at what I can do. Hey, look at what I can do. And instead of taking that and saying, hey, look at what I can do. And this is why it's really going to help you is something that businesses haven't really like grasped onto, mm -hmm. which is great because then like we talk about it, some of them do, right? Some of them internally may think about a lot of that stuff, but it's not conveyed on a website. So mm -hmm. that's really where our sweet sauce is. I like to really focus on brand and then I really like to focus on users. So if we were to get really super technical, um, it's user experience slash like design, no, growth driven design basically technical terms got it got it yeah, yeah that a lot of that resonates with with how how we think about uh all the things we do that you have to be balancing you know the brand that you're putting out there and if that is resonating with the audience in all that you do you know your website your social media whatever the things are but your customer experience uh should should be you know, putting your brand in the best light, but with a really, you know, user-centered approach. Yeah. And and nine times out of 10, it's not like companies are coming in here and being just like, oh, they had a really great widget. You should buy it, right? Like nine times <laughs> out of 10, someone makes these really cool widgets because they are trying to solve a problem. But why they won't talk about it is is so baffling. It's just a little like, little extra flip. Yes, a yeah. lot of people just don't. They might talk about it even like in sort of social or, or if they're giving a presentation or, or something along those lines, but a lot of people do sort of miss that mark whenever it comes to the website. Yeah, agreed. I, I think sometimes for clients, you know, a lot of what we do, and it sounds like a lot of what you do is really just shift those perspectives of like, you know, you have a very interesting story of how you decided to build this widget let's tell it you know it's important to get it out there and there's you know sometimes there's fear or there's hesitation to doing that so we might spend 
weeks just getting a client over that fear hurdle <laughs> and into the acceptance phase <laughs> where they are freely telling their story uh, in a way that's you know authentic to their brand. But that is that is a uh, certainly something we we or do even I don't know if you guys have experienced this one, but like pulling them out of the weeds, like mm -hmm. sometimes will take me like, and and this is what I tell them is like this is I mean this is why you hire me right like I'm coming in here like I don't know what you do explain it to me. And you're going really into like industry speak, technicalities of stuff. Why do I need a lawyer to make a will for me? I don't need to know all of the things that like the numbers and like all this other stuff. Talk to me about why I need to have a lawyer versus going to lawyer Google and saying, giving me a will, right? Like that's the kind of stuff like a lot of my clients also like, and, and I do it too. I can't do marketing for my own business too, because I get into like super technical terms. I have to have someone else because I'm mm -hmm. an expert, right? Like I'm going to get super technical. I'm sure you guys do the same thing. You guys do really good. Actually, you guys do phenomenal marketing for your own brand. So like, um, Thanks. take notes sometimes, <laughs> but I, I mean, I have the same problem too. I have to hire someone to help me kind of pull me out of there. Like, why do I care? I am a plumber. Why do I need a business? I don't know. What you need. You know what I mean? Or why do you need a website? And I'm website, just like, right. yeah. So it's, it's nice to have an outside person. So yeah, it's the branding aspect of things, but it's also like, let's get out of the weeds a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I can think of the times when we look back at a website that of, of, of some of our own marketing and um, that we've done like a year before. I'm like, why did we write that? I'm like, what were we... <laughs> What, what was the thought there yeah. through our heads? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's, you know, I think that's another kind of advantage as create creative types in the roles that we have is that um, we're really comfortable. I think most of us are really comfortable with putting the Microsoft on or the microscope on ourselves or on our past work and really saying, is that the way we want to position that? Like, I think so many you know, companies kind of set it and forget it. You know, we have this website, we put, we, we spent so much time, you know, really thinking about the language and the messaging and all of that. And then they just kind of say, okay, we're good, you know, and, and you might be good for a year or I don't know, it depends on your industry and it depends on the circumstances. I would say like in, in the, this past year, year and a half that we've had, nobody should have not been working on their website. Like everybody should be, have been working on their website and adjusting it for the behavior changes that were happening, you know, the sensitivity and the thoughtfulness about, you know, how things are being delivered. Like so many, there's really not a business that didn't have to make an update, you know? Sure. <laughs> so very, very you should always be looking back is my, is my point and be, you know, it's uncomfortable sometimes to, to look back, but I, I think it's, it's so helpful in moving forward. Well, and I think a lot of people don't see still to this day, which is mind blowing to me, they don't see the value of website. So it's yeah. like, it's broken. It needs fixed. Okay. Yeah. We could do a redesign, but why do we need to? So at, at least a lot of the people um, that are sort of in my circle that I would sort of sell to some of them know, right. And they're like, here's my money. Like, yeah, I know I need a website. Like I've been sitting on this for too long. So but then there's others that are like, yeah, listen, I did this, you know, my mother's brother's cousin is right over here. What do you, what's mobile friendly? And it doesn't need to, no one's looking at it on the phone. Like, um, anyways, so like, I think, I think the, the, the challenge is, is, and, and this is a, whoever coined this phrase, like I now want to coin this other phrase. So whoever coined the phrase of like, when you drive the car off a lot, it depreciates in value. When you launch a website, it depreciates in value right? Mm -hmm. Un unless you can do iterative changes or you're doing like design growth changes where you are constantly doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and I tell my clients that when you launch this, it is, it's, it's, some of it is going to become obsolete. There's going to be better code that is going to be implemented seven times in the two, three months that we've been doing this. So right. I want to coin the term, like once we launch your site is, <laughs> is, is outdated almost. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough pill for the client to swallow, I can tell you, yes. but we, I, yes. I totally get it. We totally get that. Um, yeah. and we, we like to say, you know, just 
I think a lot of clients are in the mentality, well, once I have this great new website that you're building for me, I'm done with marketing. I can, it, like the business is just going to flood in. Yeah. And you, you have to uh, implement all your inbound strategies that you were talking about earlier to get people to the great website that you just invested in so that they can take the actions that you want them to take, that you've yeah. invested all that time on what to put, what, what words to put on that button to make them click it, right? Um, you got to get the people there. And I, I, th I think that we, we do a lot of, I think, education around um, just building the website and they will not come. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's much more to be done after that website is launched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's where data can really help, you know, where you can, you know, trying to build into the project, not just the setting up of the site in the first place, but also some sort of a tool to be watching what does it do so you can, so they can see themselves that over time things deteriorate. I mean, that's part of why, you know, I have a bad car is because I'm not able to see, I don't, I don't have Google Data Studio for my car to tell me, oh, hey, <laughs> this needs help now. <laughs> Your oil is, is severely low. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we have a lot of great tools at our disposal to help our clients, you know, and your yeah. clients too make good decisions about the future of their website. Yeah, and luckily from from my, my luckily, um, I, I work with a lot of CMOs inside of companies, right? So they're hiring us to sort of come in and help with the website as a part of their like longer strategy of things like mm -hmm. the whole idea of inbound, uh, Am I using? It's not. Is it outbound or is it? No, it's inbound. Yeah, you okay. can say inbound. Yep. Okay. So the the thought of inbound, I mean, we we tried it, right? Like it's it's tough. It's super tough. And and for you guys to have sort of that next step that you're dealing with with clients, like tip my hat to you on that. Most of the time, we deal with the the CMOs who are doing a lot of that, or I deal with like the plumbers, right, of the world that are just like. Yeah, I'm not really yeah. worried about it. I got more business than I know what to do with, but it's broken right now. So I need it fixed, right? So like, those are my sort of two big delineations. And and yeah, it's the same thing actually. So we created a whole article of, so you're live, what's now? Like you are not gonna become a millionaire once we actually go live with this e-commerce site, right? Like, and but a lot of people do, they're like, well, what am I going to do once, you know, a hundred and I'm like, uh, no, it's, I'm sorry. I wish, I wish it were that, but it's not, you don't have any inbound strategy. You're not talking about it. You don't have an audience, anything along mm -hmm. those lines. Mm -hmm. So it is sometimes a little bit of like a, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm going to write this article and that's going to, that's going to be the tough one. It's going to clear it all up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's always the hope. I'm going to write this blog post. It's going to clear what everybody. What do you do with all all the business that you get from that blog post. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. That's the question. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we kind of, you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier in our talk here, but um, kind of just bringing it back home to, to uh, sort of inspiration around what, what do you think, you know, the future looks like for women who are you know, starting a business and um, you, you mentioned, you think there's going to be more of them. Um, what, like, what advice would you have for them? Oh. Um, so two, actually. Um, the first one is learn your numbers, mm -hmm. learn your numbers, learn your numbers, learn your numbers. Mm -hmm. super important and don't so I'm not a big advice person I'm a big experience person so I have trouble with my numbers and it was something I avoided for a really 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 long time um because I was like I was making money right margin mm -hmm. what's margin cool I'm I have margin because I'm making money right like it's fine um so finally got to a point in time where I was like, yeah, I should probably, I should know what margin is. I should know sort of what some of these things are that they're talking about. Like I was really obsessed with like Shark Tank for a while there too. And I was like, <laughs> I couldn't answer any of these questions that they're asking people and like they would tear me apart. So, um, but I will say this much too. I, I would highly suggest that someone not pay someone to sort of uh, do it all pay someone to teach you 
right? You may not need to do some of the the bookkeeping and all this other stuff, but you need to know a lot of this stuff, putting it all together, not my strong suit. I pay someone to help me do that, but they explain it to me every week, what's going mm -hmm. on, what, what we're seeing. And, and I see things cause I know the business. Um, that's my, that's kind of my number one is, is, yeah. I, you know, women, men, they, whatever, like, mm -hmm know your numbers. And second of all is find your community. So I think the big thing is, and, and again, I'll go back to experience on this one. I am a big, strong woman, right? Like I don't need any help. I don't need a community. I got this. I can do this. I'm smart. Right. And I think that the reality, is, I don't care what your community is. For me, it is, it's women, right? Like I enjoy conversations with other women business owners. I enjoy conversation with, with women professionals. Um, I, I enjoy, you know, Chatham's Women Business Center it creates a great space for women business owners mm -hmm. and for women professionals. That's my community. That's what I really gravitate to. And that's what I enjoy being a part of. But I, I and, and I don't know if a lot of women w would think that, or if, if I feel like a lot of, and this is strictly a, a feeling, but I feel like a lot of women try to take it all on their own, right? We're nurturers, we're, we carry a lot of that stuff. I did, I still do sometimes. Um, I forget that I have a wife and it's like, oh, I can share this responsibility. Like I don't have to do it all. I don't have to bring it all home and feed my daughter and do all this stuff. I can have someone help me, that's amazing. So, mm -hmm. but it, it's also, so, it's just that relatability. So like, even if you want to get like super micro, like if, if anyone is watching this sort of like in a Pittsburgh area, there's, um, there's mompreneurs groups. I mean, you can get, I mean, there's probably lesbian mom business owners, right? And, mm -hmm. and maybe even people of color, lesbian mom business owners, like <laughs> it's very granular. Uh, my biggest thing is just find your community and, and then really like be, be a part of that. Talk about some struggles that you're having and, yeah. and you'll, you'll get to where you want to go faster. Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. That's great. That's great advice. I think that, um, I, that resonates a lot with me. Um, both of those pieces of advice, I think, um, it's a, it's a constant, uh, I don't want to say struggle, but sort of learning exercise with the numbers and, and getting to know them and getting to figure out how to use the data that you have in, in really good ways to grow your business, making the right decisions. Um, but that community part is so key and so clutch to, you know, you're, you're not alone in being a business owner. If you're a business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, you're not alone, regardless of female, male, whatever gender, you're not alone. There are other people out there that are experiencing what you're experiencing. So kind of find your people, whatever that is to you and be kind of be open. Have you dealt with this? How did you solve this problem? And it is, and then that's kind of what I felt I got out, you know, what you can get out of Chatham's um, program in particular is that you, you can be, you're in a safe space where you can be open and not judge and have people say, here's how I solved that problem. And then it's like, oh, that's interesting. I could probably try that. It's, just, it's a great place. And, and I'm actually interested because I was listening to a, a podcast and I guess someone at some point in time had said like women feel threatened or, or some, somewhere along the line, society had told us that like women are our other competition. Mm -hmm. And, and I listened to this and I was like, I, I remember hearing that when I was younger, but I personally have never experienced this. Have either one of you experienced this? I've always experienced exactly what you guys, you know, we're, we're all here promoting each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've experienced. So if you guys experience and like, don't throw shade on other women, but like, um, I mean, ha have you guys experienced something I, like that? Yeah, I would say I experienced it more when I was an employee, you know, when I was a mm -hmm. part of a team and not maybe running the team or being my own entrepreneur. Um, and I, and I, I think that that is a thing. Like, I, I, I think that, um, that happens with men too. I mean, you're, you're, you've got people that are competitive in nature and they're going to exhibit that in certain ways in the workforce. Um, so I do think that, that, that can happen as far as like my experience as a female entrepreneur, when I see another 
female entrepreneur doing something amazing, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a, I'm so happy for them. That is so great. Like, I want to get to know their origin story and how that happened. Like, I'm more like, how do I amplify this thing, you know? Um, but I think that, you know, when you get down to the more like team member level, maybe the competitive with competitiveness happens more so there. I don't know, but that's, that's my personal experience. I don't know. How about you, Cynthia? I would agree with that, that you can identify that sort of backstabbing and things more in other situations than sort of like one but mm -hmm. there's there it's it, I would say it's more the exception than the rule maybe to Misha's mm -hmm. your, your point that it does happen but um then you know that that's the person not to trust and then they they get left out you know mm -hmm. uh, I can remember times you know being in a in a play or something and it turns out that someone I thought I could trust I could not you know things like yeah. that. So different kinds of environments, but I don't think women are worse about it than men are. Oh, this is Max, by the way. <laughs> Max. Yeah, this is Max. that's Max yeah. the cat. Hi, Max. Max, Max the cat. <laughs> he just likes to make an appearance on our videos. So. Yes, Aww. he's he's See, quite the he, celebrity, I feel. He likes to be a part of the conversation. Who doesn't? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a boy, right. but we'll let him in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> boys are cool. Boys are cool. Yeah, boys are boys cool. Are cool. So um, I have a really quick question before we wrap up, because okay. I know that you guys actually want to wrap up. So in honor, uh, and I hopefully this is not a, a, a big question, but like in honor of women's business, I actually kind of want to ask you guys, like who, who do both of you look up to as, a, as another woman business owner? Mm -hmm. uh, my mine has been the same person for a very long time and so it's easy for me to answer this and that's my aunt she started a company um you know in an industry that was ripe for in, uh, innovation and in the senior housing industry and she opened a company called a place for mom and you know there's she she did it with two male founders and uh she hired mostly women to deal with families that were searching for care for their aging loved ones. She, she needed those frontline folks to be nurturing and compassionate and caring. And she armed her, you know, force with a bunch of women. And um, so, but even before she started that company, she was always somebody in business that I could look up to and look at her path and how, not to say that I followed it in any way, but like, how, how did she get to where she was? What sorts of things was she dealing with? Um, how does she lead? How does she manage? And I don't manage or lead in the same way, but it, I took inspiration from it or was informed by that in, in sort of major ways. And um, so she's, you know, I remember very distinctly in sixth grade having, you know, getting a question on one of those like, you know, PSATs or whatever they were, uh, those tests you have, standardized tests you have to take and you had to write about who's your hero, you know, and I, I picked her. and you know, she's just been sort of a beacon of um, inspiration for my own career since the early days. That's awesome. Is she still the owner? She sold the company in 2010 and, and then she sold it again. Uh, she stayed the CEO. She appointed a CEO. She stayed a part of the board. They sold it again. And then I think they sold it again another time. So she, she's retired um, huh. at, at a very early age you know, late forties, oh. early fifties, she was able to retire and she, now she invests in other people's businesses and she, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. I, I have a friend who does sales for a uh, place for mom. She loves it. Oh. Absolutely loves it. So cool. I was like, that's awesome to hear. <laughs> yeah. 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 But anyway, yeah. Uh, what about you? I similarly have been inspired by a family member and that's my mom. My parents, um, had their own company in Butler. Um, they moved uh, a whole family out there, when, you know, in 1972 and um, started this thing. And my, my dad and my mom both ran it. Um, and my mom's just a really smart lady. So she, uh, she is still someone that I turn to now, like for advice, you know, tips, and, you know, all the things about running and making decisions, all the hard decisions of human resources and, and things like that. You know, she's always someone I can think back to and, um, even just, you know, sympathize with. So she's yeah. been like my, she's, I would say she's my biggest inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. How about you? Who's your inspiration? Um, so it's kind of embarrassing because I actually don't know her name, but uh, it's the founder of Spanx. 
Oh so, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She's yeah, good. Yeah. She's amazing. And, mm-hmm. and the level of vulnerability and truth that she does, she talks about like mm-hmm. uh, of being, you know, a, a wreck of a mom and just surviving all this stuff. What is her name? I'm going to look it up for you. I know, right? It's Sarah, so embarrassing. I should know it. Her name is Sarah. This is also mm-hmm. my name. Blakely. Right? Is that Sarah? Yes. Tre- Trelevin mm-hmm. Blakely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sarah Blakely. So that's, that's one of mine. I mean, she's absolutely amazing, but she's always been very humble and vulnerable mm-hmm. and honest about like where she came from, how hard she had to work and, and how she got to this day. And she invests back. She invests a lot back mm-hmm. into women's businesses. She does. So she does. yeah, that's, awesome. that's mine. That's a good one. There's a lot of great examples out there. there and I, I would say the way that we could close this is, you know, encourage people to go out there and look at, you know, some of the local examples of women-owned businesses that are doing great things. There's so many I could, maybe we can put some in the newsletter for people to explore, but I would encourage everybody to um, really explore and take a look at some of these inspirational female leaders that we have. And thank Welcome. you, Misha. Thank you, ladies. Thank I appreciate it for being here with us. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome. All right. Bye. Bye.